gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. The term culture originates from the Latin word cultivate. Communities are generally made up of people who share cultural characteristics. These cultural characteristics are defined by various influences, including geographical, spiritual, and agricultural considerations. Certain cultures impose distinct limitations or boundaries that make them unique. The purpose of this program is to introduce you to the most interesting and unique cultures from around the world. A land of endless spring lies just past the waves of the Atlantic Ocean and some 400 kilometers from the Canary Islands, the Portuguese island of Madeira. Madeira is well known around the world for its quality wines, wild nature, and traditional artistic crafts. We will travel from the European island of Madeira to the theater of miracles that is Java. Madeira, the pearl of the Atlantic, and Java, the gem of Indonesia. We bring you both on today's edition of Unusual Cultures. Portuguese sailors came upon a mesmerizing island during their 15th century explorations of the African coast. They were so enchanted by its pleasant climate, they gave the island the name, the Island of Endless Spring. Today, it's known as Madeira. Though it is not far from the sunny beaches of the Canary Islands, the main reason people come to Madeira is to admire its unique natural beauty. Thick clouds ensure an abundance of water. The entire island is supplied with water by way of terraced plots that are fed by a clever system of canals. During the golden age of seafaring, Madeira was an important source of water and other supplies needed by ocean-going ships in order to complete their lengthy expeditions. But the brave sailors needed more to drink than just water. On Madeira, they also found a plentiful supply of first-class wine. Today, Madeira is world-renowned for its wine. During long expeditions that would take ships past the equator, 99% alcohol was added to the wine, so as to ensure it didn't spoil. The alcohol killed all the germs and prevented fermentation, which would have turned the wine into vinegar. This technique is still used today. In order to allow the heat to release the taste from oak wood casks, the casks are placed directly beneath the roof. After the wine is bottled, it is stored. It won't be offered for sale until it is at least four years old. The winemakers of Madeira will only bottle their wine at night, and only if the moon is not full. They believe that bottling under the full moon could adversely affect the quality of the wine. <laughs> under the headline, It's a Small World, when men the world over hear the word Madeira, they first think of wine, and then usually they think of women wearing beautifully embroidered lace. Sold internationally, Madeira lace can cost hundreds of dollars. The manufacturing of lace is both difficult and time-consuming, but on Madeira, it also has a wine connection. In the 19th century, the vineyard of an Englishman named Phelps was wiped out by a phylloxera outbreak. Phelps's daughter came up with the idea of using the workers of the vineyard to embroider lace. Lace making has been developing and maturing over the years, reaching a level of international stardom.
Another craft that has been developing since the time of the first Madeira settlers is wickerwork. These wickerwork techniques have been passed down for generations. The twigs are collected early in the spring. In order to ensure and maintain their flexibility, they are boiled in water. The craftsmen of Madeira not only make beautiful tables and chairs, they are just as likely to create unusual and striking decorative pieces. It is essential to also create products that can be used every day. A wicker sleigh was first used at the end of the 19th century to go down the 600-meter high Mount Monte to the town of Funchal. This was the very first means of transportation on Madeira. Today, the sleigh is more of a tourist attraction. Whale hunting was the unmistakable influence in the development of the building of towns on the island. In the 1950s, the epic movie Moby Dick was made in Canacao, the most easterly town on Madeira. In a reflection of just how times have changed, the man who now runs the local whale museum was formerly the captain of a whale hunting boat. Fortunately for whales, these days, the old hunters pass time in the shade of trees, amusing themselves with a lively game of cards. The rugged coast of Madeira is not ideal for swimming or sunbathing. The beaches are deserted but the sea is full of life. Fishermen need not sail for the open ocean, as there is plenty of good fishing within a few miles of the island. The most common fishing catch is the sardine. Sardines are often used as bait when fishing for tuna. The sardines are lured using a special dough and are hauled aboard in nets. The fishermen immobilize the sardines by biting out their gills before they put them at the end of their fishing rods. This sort of bait is a magnet for tuna. Their colorful bodies are soon spotted beneath the surface. Unfortunately, today none of them took the bait. The fishermen will be returning empty-handed. Fortunately, tuna is not the only delicacy in these waters. A wide range of other seafood is also popular on Madeira. The gates to well-supplied seafood markets open daily. The Mercado dos Labradores is the most famous market on Madeira. On a Friday afternoon, this market is a beehive of activity. Here we find lumps of pink tuna, but you'll see fish of all sizes and colors, including the unsightly black and toothy espada, a local specialty. These fish live some 1,000 meters below the surface. When they are brought up from the depths, the change of pressure causes their silvery color to blacken and their eyes to bulge. Salty dried cod is a must-have from the local markets. It's an important part of the menu at the St. Martin Festival. They cover it with hot spices and grill it. They like to wash it down with young wine.
Another delicacy is the espatada, diced beef with garlic and salt on laurel sticks grilled over strong heat. In the past, this was a meal of the poor. Meat left over from the kitchens of rich families would be gathered and grilled by the poor. Today, it is a delicacy made from prime beef. Traditional Madeira bread is the best accompaniment to any meal. The dough is baked in acacia wood-burning ovens. Underlined by a garlic butter spread, which gives the bread its unmistakable taste and aroma. The St. Martin Festival is definitely not a one-night affair. Groups of bakers, winemakers, and cooks keep putting out their wares over three days and nights. It is expected that the guests remain as long as they can manage. Madeira is considered, geographically speaking, both close and far to Europe. The island is a living example of how settlers managed to adapt to the hostile yet naturally rich environment. In the time of the settlers, Madeira was used by the Portuguese as a resupply base from which they would then set sail on lengthy explorations. Some of these ships made it all the way to Indonesia, where they eventually colonized many islands, including the island of Java. Java is where we are now headed. The rising Java sun is about to wake up its 135 million inhabitants. Java has the highest population per square kilometer of any island in the world. Whether day or night, the cities resemble human anthills. Because of its religious tolerance, the chaos of everyday Java life has a spiritual dimension. Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists cohabitate peacefully. Though today's Java is predominantly Muslim, there was a time when Java was the center of a Hindu empire, whose sheer size is evidenced by the great number of temples and venerable monuments. Yogyakarta was once the capital city of Java. However, it is still considered Java's spiritual capital due to the number of temples found here devoted to reflection, prayer, and meditation. Hundreds of pachaks, the Java equivalent of the pedicab, fueled solely by pedal power, skillfully weave through the thick traffic. A ride in one of these only costs around 30 cents. That's why it is hard for an owner to make a living, especially given the brutal competition. Operators spend much of their time waiting for customers. Tourists and those of the upper class make use of waiting carriages and buses. This further reduces the number of customers that will use the pedicabs, which practically run into each other fighting for a fare. But the clear transport of choice on Java and throughout Indonesia is the motorcycle. Annual sales for motorcycles top three million. Real Java life takes place on the street. One of the purely local inventions is the fast food on wheels known as Waran. A discreet sign is all you need. The nimble cook quickly rolls out his pre-cooked food, which can sometimes be dragged from place to place for several days. By international hygiene standards, the local catering may appear suicidal, but the locals enjoy it. A selection of delicacies are available in the bird markets, which originated among the ruins of a sultan's palace from the 19th century.
However, the available larvae and bugs are meant exclusively for the birds. Birds are a Javanese favorite. After the various parrots and non-parrot singing birds, pigeons are most in demand. Once the Javanese purchase them, they usually set the pigeons free. The freed pigeons make a few thankful circles only to proceed to their initial seller, who immediately resells them. Arab merchants brought the Islamic belief to Indonesia in the 15th century. The religion takes on a slightly different structure in Indonesia due to the blending of its many different cultures. For example, when the muezzin calls for prayers from the mosque's minaret, it is accompanied by distinctive Java drums, a habit acquired from Hinduism. Hinduism, which reached Java long before Islam, is also not practiced in its classical form. The temples Chandi Cheto and Suku are examples of a unique blending of the Hindu faith with ancient animistic cultures. This fact confuses the historians. The evidence suggests that these temples were built in the 15th century when Hinduism is known to have almost ceased to exist on the islands. Both temples are also very unusual in their appearance and decoration. The distinctive erotic reliefs celebrating life's energy and sexuality are mismatched here with inexplicable motifs from the animistic cults. Buddhism is a third heavily practiced Javanese religious tradition. Even though it nearly ceased to exist on the island, one monumental reminder still remains. The Boro Badur Temple, listed with the UNESCO National Heritage. A five-story stepped pyramid rises from a square, decorated with reliefs symbolizing Buddha's path to enlightenment. The pilgrim wishing to reach the top, which represents reaching nirvana or paradise, must traverse a total length of five kilometers. The temple is decorated with 1,500 panels featuring relief decorations. The Prambanan Temple is just as breathtaking as Borobudur. It was also built during the 8th century. The building has a classical structure of three buildings, each for one of the Hindu gods, Shiva, Brahma, and Vishnu. The typical Buddhist stupa proves that the blending of different cultures and religious tolerance here has an ancient tradition. The rich reliefs on the walls depict the famous Hindu epos, Ramajana. This epos has deep roots and appears in many of the traditional forms of Javanese art. One of those forms is the ballet. In the ballet, each movement has a clear meaning, telling the story of Prince Rama, who must kill the demonic king who captured his wife, Sita. During his quest, Rama makes friends with Sir Griwa, king of the monkeys. Together, they defeat the evil king. The Wayang Kulit Theater of Shadows is also very popular. The puppets are made from buffalo hide. Often, the show can go on for the entire night. A single puppet master is usually accompanied by a traditional Hindu orchestra.
The traditional Hindu orchestra consists of several instruments. According to the legend, the instrument imitates the sound of nature before the creation of man. It is known as gamelan, the original voice of Mother Nature. The greatest of the gamelan, Sekhetem, seen here, was once used by the Muslims to convert pagans. He who wished to listen to the sound of the Sekhetem had to first convert to Islam. Today, the Sekhetem is heard only once a year, for a whole week during the celebrations associated with the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Let us see how they make such an instrument. A bronze gamelan gong is created by a blacksmith. Fire is its father, and the blows of a hammer its mother. Tuning a gong requires a great deal of experience. New students are honored to learn the craft in the workshop of Master Tentra, a direct descendant of the family that made gamelan instruments for the Javanese Sultan since the 15th century. The instrument is tuned by the gradual grinding of the thick metal. It must be tuned in its first year of service and again as it matures in its fifth year of service. A bucket of melted wax is fundamental for the renowned art of Javanese women, batik. The artist draws her design on paper and then traces it onto the fabric. The process is gradually repeated the result may be complex pictures with an intricate yet subtle structure. The batik painting is the result of the light, which allows for amazing color gradation. It is impossible to decide the color up front. Each piece is an original. Nature motifs on batiks are often inspired by the dramatic Javanese landscape. For instance, mountains enveloped in mist. The mountains are home to hundreds of square kilometers of world-famous tea plantations. The tea leaves are collected carefully at dawn, often adorned by droplets of morning dew. The collectors use a special wooden cross to determine which leaves to pick so that the plantation remains sustainable. Ten kilos of collected tea is worth around 50 cents. Once they're off the truck, the leaves undertake a journey through several other important stages before the result is the final product. And the final product is a world-renowned tea that is one of Java's most important exports. The tea plantations are a pleasant, calming sight, as is Java as a whole. It is an island that touts both a high density of population and a cohesive cultural face, a fact that reflects the centuries of mixed religious and ethnic influences. Despite its occasional earthquake, Java remains steadfast throughout time as a jewel in the crown of Indonesia.